Good evening. You are listening to LPJ. Speaker Radio with Mr. and Mrs. Freethink. How are you today? Oh, I am doing wonderful. What a glorious day it has been today, and how are you doing? I'm fine. We had a great day. It was beautiful. 60, uh... Yes, I was uh, able to get out there and do a little walking yeah, there. The Lord blessed us with some nice weather today. He blessed us to see this day come, mm-hmm. and now we're watching it go away. He has been good. He's blessed to see another day. Hope that he saw you and your family uh, with a blessed day today. Saw us to and from work today. Blessed us with a job today. We got up and went to work, so that was a blessing that we had a job. Some place in this world, some people didn't have a job. That's right. Some place in this world, someone went to work today, and they say we no longer need you. Or, sorry, we have to lay someone off, and you have to be that one. Mm-hmm. So we have been blessed that we went to work, and we was able to work today and keep our jobs. We was able to leave our jobs and was able to say, we'll see you tomorrow. So we, we were blessed. Maybe you don't think you were, but... You had good news when you went in, and you had good news when you left out the door this evening. That's right. No matter the circumstances that you're going through, God is good. Rejoice, he said, and I say rejoice. Rejoice in his name. In his name. In his name. And the title tonight is Jesus is the Rock. He is the Rock. There is no other rock. I don't know what rock you used to been talking about or hearing about, but we're talking about the rock of life. That's right, rock of ages. The rock of ages, the yeah. gift of life. Amen. Uh, the salvation, uh, the rock that gives life, the rock that saves life, mm-hmm. that have given life, that have taken our burdens, the rock that cares all, the rock that you drink from. I mean, you can think about a whole lot of names for this rock. Yeah, well, the main rock. one is Jesus is the rock. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> and in First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, it says, And did all drink the same spiritual drink? For they drank of the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Yes. Because you, yeah, you know, Jesus got mad, upset with Moses, because he told Moses, to speak to the to rock, speak to the rock, and but Moses got mad and struck the rock, and that's so why he didn't see the promised land. Yeah, that's why he told Moses he wouldn't see the promised land. Not that he wouldn't make it to heaven, but he wouldn't see the promised land. Right, and that's what he told Moses because Moses struck the rock, and instead of speaking to the rock, he struck it, and so God is our rock. You heard that on LPJ, and that is love, love peace, peace, and, and joy. joy.
And you're listening to Speaker Radio LPJ, Mr. and Mrs. Sweet Thing. That was I Shall Not Be Moved. Yeah. 
Your attention, please. Announcing Melody Airlines Flight 145 to Quiet Time. Now loading at Gate 21 on the Blue Concourse. Last call. This is your captain, Harold Lucky. Welcome aboard Melody Airlines Flight 145 to Quiet Time. We're happy to have you with us, and we'd like for you now to relax and enjoy the music. Today and strengthen all who lack the faith to call on thee each day. Heal our land. Please keep us safe and free. Watch over all who understand the need for liberty. Heal our land. Heal our land. And guide us with thy hand Keep us ever on the path of liberty Heal our land, heal our land And help us understand That we must put our trust in thee If we would be free Please help us find our way For in thy word We find our strength If we look up each day Heal our land And fill us with thy love Keep us upon the path of truth That comes from heaven above Heal our land, heal our land, and guide us with thy hand. Keep us ever on the path of liberty. Heal our land, heal our land, and help us understand 
that we must put our trust in Thee, if we would be free. Protect us by the power of Thy rod, and keep us as one nation under God. Heal our land, heal our land, and guide us with thy hand. Keep us ever on the path of liberty. Heal our land, heal our land, and help us understand that we must put our trust in thee. If we would be free. And I'll tell you, God will never take anybody to heaven who would not rather die than sin. Now you mark that down. We're going to be talking more about that as we move along in our studies. God will take nobody to heaven who would not choose to die before he would be disloyal and disobedient to God. Now, friends, the Today, amazing facts speaker Joe Cruz answers the question, can God trust man with immortality? How can God know that immortalized man will not choose to sin again? Stay tuned for the crusade subject, Satan's Confusing Counterfeits. Suppose you had to summarize the entire Bible in just two words. I wonder what you'd choose. I've thought about this, friends, and I believe those two words would have to be sin and salvation. Because really, that's what the entire Bible is all about, from Genesis to Revelation. Isn't that right? In the book of Genesis, the old devil came in, you know, to make man sin and to steal away his salvation. And by the way, that was the turning point of the human family. You see, God had based everything on obedience. He had given man all those wonderful gifts, life, righteous character, dominion over the earth, beautiful home in the Garden of Eden. And he said, all of this can be yours on one condition only, and that is you obey. Obey and live, disobey and die. Well, we know, of course, what man did. And sin came down to this earth. It transferred from heaven down to this planet. And man lost all of those wonderful things that he had gained. And you know, from that point, as soon as sin and transgression came into the human family, it was a story of conflict. In other words, it was a mighty controversy going on between God and Satan, truth and error, obedience and disobedience. And the whole Bible from that point on is filled with this great controversy. And it's also filled with God's great plan and program to bring man back to that original position of obedience from which he fell. In fact, every book of the Bible, every chapter and verse and line practically is occupied with that tremendous program of God and heaven to restore man back to that original position. Thou shalt call his name Jesus, the Bible says, for he shall save his people from their sin. Now, sin, of course, is disobedience, isn't it? It's breaking the law. Now, I've had people say to me, well, you know, Brother Joe, that old business of works and keeping the law and obeying the commandments, that's only external uh, fleshly things. Those are the outward works, and God is not interested in those things. He's only interested in the heart. Well, now, friends, let me tell you something. Back in the beginning, that was the big issue, wasn't it? Obedience. You see, that's always been God's test of love and God's test of loyalty is our willingness to serve him and obey him. And in the beginning, God said, this is it. If you want to really show your love for me, if you want to show that you're loyal to me, keep my commandments, obey me. I'm giving you this word and this commandment. And so it has always been, friends. We come down to the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. And you know, once again, we find that the great test God has made is the same, a test of love, a test of loyalty. In fact, the outstanding characteristic of those in the book of Revelation who will be saved out of this earth and translated from this earth are those that keep the commandments of God. 
You see, the conditions that God set up in the beginning for man to remain in the Garden of Eden became the conditions in the book of Revelation for man to re return to the Garden of Eden. The very same. In fact, you just go through that last book of the Bible and you'll find it so. Revelation 14, 12. Here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Revelation 12, 17, the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Revelation 22, 14, blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. So friends, God must have a people that he can trust with immortality and with eternal life. I mean, God is not going to take away our power of choice when he takes us to heaven, is he? When we receive immortality, are we also going to be deprived of the power of choosing and making our own decisions? Why, of course not. And throughout all eternity, it will still be left up to those redeemed people to make their own choices and their own decisions. Now, you might say, well, Brother Joe, you know, that's a dangerous thing for God to take people to heaven who might choose to disobey him again. Suppose sin comes into this world again, and we have to go through another long 6,000-year siege of this suffering and pain and death. Well, now, friends, that will never happen. We know that. The Bible says that affliction will not rise the second time, so there won't be any more choices by people to disobey God. Well, you say, how can God know that? How can he trust us? with uh, eternal life. And what about the angels? You know, how are they going to know that we'll not subject the universe to the same long siege of, of death as we have before by transgression? Well, now, friends, God will know because of what we are now and what we're doing now. You see, this is the testing place. This is where we prove to God, my friends, that we can be loyal to him, that we can choose to obey him under any circumstances whatsoever. And I'll tell you, God will never take anybody to heaven who would not rather die than sin. Now, you mark that down. We're going to be talking more about that as we move along in our studies. God will take nobody to heaven who would not choose to die before he would be disloyal and disobedient to God. Now, friends, the program of Satan has always been to make man disobey, to make man sin. See, Satan knows that sin will never go to heaven. No sin will go through the gates of the city. Revelation 21, 27 says, Nothing that defileth will go through the gates of that city. And sin is the only thing that defiles as far as God is concerned. And as I mentioned the other day, you know, the devil knew and understood a principle long before the apostle Paul ever wrote it down in his, in his uh, epistle. Let's turn to Romans 6 now for our first text. In Romans 6, verse 16, here is a tremendous principle that Satan knew and understood long ago, even before the foundations of the world were laid. Know ye not, Paul writes, that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Now, Paul says in this verse that whoever we obey, we become the servant of that power. So if we obey God, we're a servant of God. If we obey sin, we're a servant of sin. If we obey Satan, we're a servant of Satan. And so you see, friends, how very important this business of obedience is. And the devil knows this. Now, if he can make you sin and keep on sinning, he can keep you out of heaven. That will be an effective way to keep you from ever going to heaven. So what do you think Satan is going to do? He's going to focus his attack against the people of this earth to make them sin and break God's law and thereby demonstrate disloyalty to him. So Satan in every generation has been creating conditions to make men sin. He has been devising strategies and tricks to make people disobey God. And uh, he's gone about it in various ways. And you know what he's done? In the book of Revelation, we find that he's distilled this whole program of attacking God's people and causing them to sin. He has distilled it down into one mighty issue of disobedience. And it's the issue, as we've discovered, of the mark of the beast and the seal of God. In other words, it's going to concern the law of God. It's going to concern keeping his commandments. And so there in the book of Revelation, we have the whole story outlined. We have the two sides represented in the great controversy. Those who follow God and keep his commandments and obey all of his commandments, whether it's easy, whether it's convenient or not, 
And then those who will choose to follow some pagan counterfeits and some pagan substitutes rather than to obey God at some disadvantage to themselves. And so that is the issue we find. Now, friends, the devil doesn't care why you disobey as long as you do it. Have you ever thought of that? I mean, you can, you can think of the most religious reason that you want to for disobeying God. And that will make Satan very happy indeed. And I can tell you right now, according to what I've studied in the Bible and in history, I have found, friends, that some of the most religious people have been the most disobedient people. Now, notice I said religious, not spiritual. And this has always been true. Religious people being disobedient to God. You say, Brother Joe, I don't understand how that could be. Why would religious people be disobedient to God? Well, friends, uh, uh, Jesus said himself, in vain... Do they worship me, teaching for doctrines and commandments of men? Now, he talked about people who were worshiping him. He was talking about people in churches. And he said, they're disobeying me. And they're worshiping me in vain because instead of keeping my commandments, they're bringing in the traditions of men and the commandments of men. Now, here's another good question I want to ask today. Who is it that is committing the most open and flagrant disobedience to God's holy law today? Who is it that's doing the most wicked things in the world? All right, now there are, there are certain laws of God in the Ten Commandments that are being broken today only by non-religious people, non-church people. For example, stealing, committing adultery, killing. You know, church people don't do those things. Oh, no. That's only the non-religious people that will do that. But I want to remind you, my friends, that there's at least one commandment among those ten that religious people and non-religious people alike are transgressing. In fact, I suppose that it's a one commandment that is being broken more than any other commandment among the ten. And like I say, the devil is rejoicing greatly because he's not only been able to deceive the non-religious people to make them break that law, but he's also got the religious world so that they're breaking it also. Now, the fourth commandment says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. But my friends, millions of Christian people today are ignoring that commandment. They're not keeping the seventh day at all. They're keeping another day of their choice rather than the one that God chose and commanded for them to keep. Now, this is a mystery. It is a mystery to me. It's a mystery to many people. But every time I think of this, my thoughts go back to that word of Jesus when he said, In vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines and commandments of men. He is saying that, that people are going to be worshiping me. They'll be doing it in my name, but he said they'll be breaking my law and keeping the traditions and commandments of men instead of keeping my law. Isn't that strange, friends? Now today, we're going to talk about Satan's two main strategies in getting people to sin, in getting people to break his law. Now remember, he wants to present a program that will cause non-religious people to sin, and he's got to come along with a program that will also make religious people sin. Because everybody is the target of Satan. And to downgrade the law of God and to, and to bring the law of God into disrepute and cause people to break the law of God, that's the program of Satan. So what is he going to do now? Two particular favorite strategies that he uses in getting people to sin or break the law of God. That's what we want to talk about right now. But remember this now. Satan is a great counterfeiter, isn't he? He's a deceiver and a liar from the very beginning, but a master counterfeiter. And he doesn't care, my friends, if you know the Bible even. You can quote the scriptures as long as you'll disobey in one point. In fact, he doesn't care if you, if you keep 90% of God's law. You can even keep 98, 99% of it, and the devil will rejoice over that as long as you will put in something there that you will disobey God in. Because as we read a moment ago in Romans 6, 16, it's whom, to whom you give your obedience that you become the servant of that power. And if you disobey God willfully and deliberately in any one point, you are not a servant of God. We just read it. And so Satan then tries to get people to break at least one of those laws and to do it willfully and deliberately. And if he can't get you to, to really study the Bible and know the Bible and understand the requirements of God, he'll twist the word around and distort the word and misapply the word so that you're still wrong in your obedience to him. 
You know, the devil can quote the Bible very well, can't he? He quoted it to Jesus, you remember, out in the, out in the desert there. And uh, he said, uh, go ahead and jump off, cast yourself down. The Bible says that angels are waiting down there to catch you up in their arms, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Go ahead and jump. You see, a presumptuous misapplication of the Bible, and he'll do that to you and he'll do it to me, if he possibly can. And so, like I say, he will mix up a lot of truth even in his own program, in his own teaching, to disarm you, see? And then he'll mix in very cleverly a little bit of his own leaven of disobedience and sin. And he'll be very happy for you to go down the road keeping 98% of the law of God and yet doing 2% of his service because he knows that will still keep you from going into the kingdom of heaven. So now let's come to these two <clears throat> things that Satan uses in attacking the law of God and in causing people to sin. Here's his first argument. He says, all right, the Bible says that only those who keep the commandments of God are going through the gates of the city into heaven. So this must mean then that, that works are the most important thing of all. And that if we can just make ourselves obey the law of God and keep those commandments perfectly, being very, very careful not to deviate in one little thing, if we can work hard enough and be good enough and keep the law well enough, why we can go to heaven, we'll get through the gates of the city. So concentrate on that. Focus on those works. Now, friends, let me ask you something. Is there some truth in that? Yes, it is important to keep the commandments of God, isn't it? We just read that in the book of Revelation. But what else is in that argument of Satan, my friends? The deadly leaven of legalism. Isn't that right? You can't work yourself to heaven. You can't save yourself by being good. You can't keep the commandments well enough to actually merit salvation and to be able to go through the gates of the city? Of course not. But Satan makes us believe that we can do it and that we ought to do it. And if we just try hard enough and apply ourselves well enough to the works of the law and the keeping of the commandments, that we can make it, we can qualify, and we'll be a part of God's people in the kingdom of heaven. Now, friends, multitudes of people have fallen for that. You know that? There are millions of people today who go under the name of Christian, who operate in the name of Christ, who are a legalist and they're trying to work their way to heaven. They believe that somehow they will be able to just uh, earn their salvation by keeping the law, by being good enough to do that. Now, you may say, uh, <clears throat> Brother Joe, I don't understand why that would make anybody break the law of God. The devil knows that things have changed since the Garden of Eden. Now, back in the Garden of Eden, of course, uh, it was easy for Adam and Eve to keep the law of God compared to us. Isn't that right? I mean, Adam and Eve had a holy nature, an unfallen, pure nature that was godlike. They were perfect in the beginning. They did not have any carnal nature within them drawing them away to sin. They didn't have the same struggle with temptation that you and I have because there was nothing within them to respond to the temptations of Satan. They did not have an inherent uh, fallen nature. They had a holy nature just like God, and it was easy for them to obey God compared to what it is for us. But you see, the devil has made us believe, friends, that we can do it just like Adam and Eve, that all we need to do is make up our mind and then put forth the effort and just try hard, and we can do it. And there are a lot of people that have fallen for that, and they feel, well, I don't need God. You know, if I just try hard enough and if I work hard enough, I can, I can make it. Friends, it won't work. It won't work. You can't keep the law of God by yourself and your own strength and by your own effort. It won't work. Now, let me, let, let me tell you something, and let me ask you something. Suppose that I could keep the law of God absolutely without a flaw from this moment right on down to the rest of my life. If I could keep the commandments of God without making a single mistake or a single error, let me ask you, would that save me? Would that save me if I could obey God perfectly from this moment right on through to the rest of my life? No, it would not. You know why? Because I sinned before this moment. Everybody in the sound of my voice has already sinned and the sentence of death has come down upon us. And the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. I don't care how good you could make yourself be from this point on. 
Even if you were able to totally keep the commandments of God, you still would have the death sentence upon you. And that would have to be taken care of, you see, by faith in the Lord Jesus and by somebody else outside of your own self. Our record of righteousness, my friends, is imperfect. Everyone who listens to me has had a blurred and blotted record as far as sin is concerned. Our record of right doing has been blurred and blotted. And right righteousness, by the way, means right doing. So our righteousness is nothing. Our right doing has not been perfect. The only individual who ever came into this world and had a perfect record of right doing was whom? Jesus Christ, of course. Now, I know people have tried to come up to his, and it's good for us, of course, to be obedient in every way and to make that decision. And I suppose if anybody ever really tried it in their own strength, it was the Pharisees. Oh, how they love to do the works and, uh, and the rules. They made up extra ones, hundreds of them, so they'd have more. They thought it would acquire more merit for them if they could just make up more laws and keep more laws. The more they could do, the more they would earn for their salvation. But one time Jesus said to his own disciples, except your righteousness shall exceed that of the Pharisees, you shall in no wise enter the kingdom of God. Can't you see Peter's face fall? He looks at Thomas, Thomas looks at John, John looks at Matthew, and they must wonder, my, what, how can I have any hope? How, how will there be any chance for me? If my right doing has to be more than those Pharisees, there's no hope for me. You see, they didn't understand, of course, that Jesus was talking about his righteousness there. But the only one who's done it right, my friends, the only righteousness that God can accept completely and perfectly is the righteousness of his own son. And unless you and I can get that righteousness to our credit, we're lost. God will never accept anything less than perfect righteousness. And you don't have it and I don't have it, but Jesus does. And somehow I've got to get his righteousness and his perfect record of right doing. I've got to get that on my account. And you know that's exactly what God will do for us. Did you know that? That's exactly what we can have done right now. Let's turn in our Bibles now to Romans 5 and verse 10. And I want you to see something very interesting in this text. Romans 5 verse 10. For if when we were enemies... We were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Now, pause with me right there. Let's look at something. It says, if when we were enemies, something has happened, friends. Man got separated from God. In the beginning, man was at one with God. There was no enmity at all. They were in perfect unity, in perfect harmony. But something happened to alienate man from God. And they became separated. And now they're enemies, according to this verse. Now, what did God do to bring us back, friends, and cure and heal the enmity that came between us and God? Well, let's read it. If when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. That's what did it. We became reconciled by his death because by accepting the death of Jesus in our place, the atonement and the ransom that he offered by taking our place on the cross, why, my friends, that lifted the death sentence, didn't it? That lifted the death sentence so that we could come back to God and be at one with him again through justification by receiving Christ as our Savior. We can have the death sentence removed. God can look upon us as though we've never sinned and we can be restored again or reconciled to God. And that's exactly what this tells us. By his death. But now, friends, after we're reconciled to him and after we're justified by faith, What else is there to do? Let's read the rest of the verse. It goes on to say, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. You see, we need both the death of Jesus and the life of Jesus. Did you notice that? We need his death to take care of our justification, to take care of our past sins, so that that can be erased and uh, and we can be reconciled to God and be at one with him again. And then it goes on to say that we need his life in order to save us. Well, my friends, that's the imparted strength and power and victory that Jesus had when he lived his life here on this earth. And the Bible said that we can have that life of Jesus, the way he lived it, we can have that imparted to us just as we can have his atoning death imputed to us. You see, that's justification and the other is sanctification. 
We need both justification and sanctification in order to prepare to meet the Lord. Will be done. 
his kingdom come on earth as it is above who is himself our daily bread praise him the lord of love let living water satisfy the thirsty without price we'll take a cup of kind Yet all glory be to Christ All glory be to Christ our King All glory be to Christ His rule and reign will ever sing All glory be to Christ When on the day the great I am the faithful and the true, the Lamb who was for sinners slain is making all things new. Behold, our God shall live with us and be our steadfast light, and we shall earn His people be all glory. Christ, all glory be to Christ our King, all glory be to Christ, His rule and reign will ever sing, all glory be to Christ, all glory be to Christ our King, all glory be to Christ. His rule and reign will ever sing all glory be to Christ. Happy New Year.
love Can I get a word? Yes, sir
said it would heal you. He said it would heal you. Yes, it did. He said it would Y'all don't mind if we take our time and say this to you. He did. He said it would heal you. Jesus said it. He said it would heal you. Read your Bible. He said it would heal you. He said it would heal you. He said it would heal you. And I know he will. He said he would heal you. The reason I know it, he said he would heal you. I done tried him. Yes, I have. I done tried him. He said he would heal you. I want to tell you about it, you.
lead to His side With love and strength for each new day He will make a way He will make a way Oh, yes He will
Evan Wood, would y'all give him a hand, ladies and gentlemen? Let me see the hands that know you've been blessed. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, if you know you've been blessed, get them hands in the air. Oh, my, 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 my. Yeah. Listen, take a look at me. I'm a miracle walking around. I can truly testify that God won't let you down. You see, I... I should have been dead a hundred times over again. But the Lord stepped in and he spared my life again. He blessed me time after time again and again. Over and over, they never end. My blessing keep coming, keep coming, keep coming. Some help us in here. Oh, yeah. I got my friend here tonight. Harvey. Day after day, he keep making way. Opening doors for me that I just could not see. He's a strong tower. What I need is strength to carry on. He restored my faith. And help me live on Time after time Again and again Over and over It never ends Just keep coming Keep on coming I get a blessing Every day You're blessed tonight. Some of y'all might have thank you. Maybe like you got hit by yourself. Got
not here on your own, but let me tell you, it was nothing but the grace of God that, that you're here tonight. Tap somebody on the shoulder and tell them, truly, truly. Say it again, say, truly. What are you? Now I want you to say it like you mean it. Just tell somebody true. True. Anybody ever felt like you got blessings when you didn't deserve being blessed? But God blessed me anyway. Ain't God a good God? Ain't God a good God? Ain't God a good God? I can look out in the audience and see my mama that lets me know I'm blessed. God been mighty good to me. And then maybe when I think about, can I say this? Then I leave it alone. I think about when I first started singing. Me and my wife, I remember when I first started singing, I had one pair of shoes. I had one suit to wear, but when I walk in my door, oh my when I walk in my door, I got shoes over here. I got shoes over there. I got clothes and street clothes. God been mighty good. Lord, I'm blessed. Could have been done. Sleeping in my grave. But he made all that get back. 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 Oh, I go, oh, 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 how many can join in and say, say truly with them? Come on. Truly. 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 Say. I'm blessed. You don't need to say it like God been good to you. Say it. Say it. Truly. Oh, good to me. Truly. I'm blessed. You ought to just put some hand clapping with that and just say it like you're truly. Truly. Come on, set for Come on. Truly, I'm blessed. We ought to just make the big Holy Ghost cry up in here. Sing it like you mean it, son. Truly, 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 I'm blessed. I'm blessed. I'm blessed. Look at me.
open up doors for me. Men and my broken husband gave the ease to my troubled mind. Took care of my family. Made a way for me. You made a way for me. You did it, Lord. You did it, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Oh, thank you, Lord. Oh, thank you, Lord. I'm telling you that blessings keep coming my way. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah.
shoulders are so troubled You don't think you count at all Waves may seem like mountains And your boat seems oh so small But somewhere past the clouds Waits a new day to begin Sometimes it takes a storm To calm the storm within Sometimes it takes a storm To know you need a shelter
is a healer. God is a healer. Yes, he is. Sometimes weapons form against you, but they'll never prosper. Remember, God is your shield. He's waiting for your call. He's waiting for your call. Waiting to shield you from your fall. And there's a place of rest and peace. There's a place of rest and peace in the sanctuary. And here's the good news. Peace is waiting. Peace is waiting. Hallelujah. In the sanctuary. Yes. 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 Peace is waiting. Peace is waiting. It's waiting for you. Come on and receive it right now. I've got one more verse. Listen. Sometimes your bills can stress you. Can I get a witness in here? But remember God's peace. He's a peace giver. He's a peace giver. I bet you can relate to this. Sometimes your money is running low and you're worried how you make it. But God will supply your He'll supply your needs. He's waiting for your call. He's waiting for your call. Waiting to shield you from your fall. And there's a place of rest and peace in the sanctuary. Everybody lift your hands if you feel him moving in this place. I feel you moving in the sanctuary. of your pain, the healer will give you peace. So thank God for thank you God the sanctuary thank you for my place of rest and peace I rest in you now
Sound, and you have been listening to LPJ. Speaker Radio and Mr. and Mrs. Sweet Thing, we've had a great night, and we just want to thank you for joining us. We hope that you enjoyed yourself. The clock on the wall says time to go somebody got to work in the morning. You know That's how that right. is. right. Praise the Lord for the job. Uh, oh, yeah. Thank the Lord for the job. We had a great time. I hope that you enjoyed yourself. And uh, we just praise the Lord as we always do. That's right. We enjoy each and every night we're able to come and lift up Jesus' name and praise him. Because we know he is a mighty, mighty healer and he is our savior. So, again, Jesus is the rock. He is the rock, the big rock. That's right. That's all we need. And in Matthew chapter 6, verse 14 and 15, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you don't forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Amen. So forgive your brother, your sister, so that God can forgive you. Amen. You heard that Amen. right here on Speaker Radio. LPJ. LPJ. Amen. Now, you know, we we just love doing this. It's so wonderful to do it for Jesus. You know, we all, God got something for all of us to do. Yes, he does. And only God knows what he has for you. Don't let anybody tell you that this is what you're supposed to do. Because only God has for you what he has for you. That's right. And he'll give it to you. And can't nobody else do it. Can't nobody, nobody else take it. That's right. So don't don't let men tell you that God has got this for you. Do because God can talk to you himself. You don't need nobody to be his his uh, <laughs> spokesman. Right. You know, God ain't ashamed to tell you what he got for you. And he ain't afraid to tell you. He don't need nobody to tell you for him. Right. Because he created every man in the likes of him. So now he don't need nobody to tell you for him. But we hope you hope you enjoyed it. We'll be back tomorrow night, same time, same place, ready to praise and lift his name again. But as we go each night, we must always talk to our Heavenly Father. So our Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight asking you, Lord, to forgive us for our sins, our hidden sins. Anything, Lord, that we have did in this day or said or any way we may have acted, Lord, that was displeasing you, Lord. We ask you, Lord, to forgive us for those things, Lord. You know that, Lord, in, in plus we're weak. In the flesh, Lord, we are very weak. Satan controls this flesh, Lord. We fall by the wayside, Lord. But we know through you, Lord, through you, Lord, you, we can always come to you, Lord, and ask you to forgive us in those, in those sins that we do, that we're weak, and that we know, Lord, through you, we can be made strong where we're weak. And we come before you, Lord, asking you to help us and make us strong where we're weak, Lord. And forgive us for those things. Lord, we know you are just God, that you will forgive us if we come before you and repent for those things. Lord, we just know that we do things that are not pleasing to you. We don't love as you have asked us to love. We ask you to forgive us for those things. We talk about people, Lord. You ask us not to do those things. You tell us to love our brothers, love our enemies, Father. So we have to come and ask you to make us strong in those weak spots that we're weak. We we can, Father. You know us better than we know ourselves. We do things don't even know what we're doing. We say things don't even know what we're saying. We think things don't know what we thought those things. So, Father, that's why it's important for us to come before you each and every day and ask you to forgive us for those sins and then hidden ones especially because we do things don't even realize that we thought them or we even uh, said them. We speak before we think sometime, Lord. So that's why we have to come and ask you to forgive us for things that we don't realize that we thought or said. But, Lord, you're so forgiving and so good that all we got to do is ask. So, Lord, we ask you tonight to have mercy on us and give us strength to become better servants and give us the Holy Spirit, that we can be more like you, Lord. We can learn to forgive and learn to love and learn to be kind and learn to be trustworthy, Lord. All those things that you have asked us to be towards our brothers and sisters of Christ, Mm -hmm. give us those things that we may be those things, Lord. Lord, we just ask you to love, to give us a 
the Holy Spirit to love those that don't like us. That is the hardest thing, Father, for us to do, mm-hmm. is to love those that do not like us and love those that mistreat us. That's the next thing, Father, it's hard to do. Give us the Holy Spirit, Father, to learn to love them. Those are the hardest things for any fleshly human being to do. It's to love those that don't like you and love those that have mistreated you. Father, we ask you to give us the love in our heart to love those two things. If we can overcome those things, Father, those two things, we can be more like you. And Father, we just ask you to give us the Holy Spirit to pray for others as you have asked us to. And we all were guilty of not praying for others, but we always come to you for selfie. Mm -hmm. We pray for selfie all the time. We ask for the Holy Spirit to pray for others before self. Esteem others more than we do ourselves, Father. Give us that those three Holy Spirit, Father. We we can we'll be we'll be doing as you have asked us to do. And then Father, give us the Holy Spirit of giving. Father. Give us that Holy Spirit too, Father. And then give us the Holy Spirit of kindness, Father. Father, then We'll be more like you. And Father, we ask you to touch. Touch those that do not know you at all, that they may be willing to give their hearts to you, that they may be willing to receive you and turn from their wicked ways and ask for your forgiveness, that they may. They may turn and give their hearts to you and learn Learn to love and learn to be kind and be willing to join you and come to your marvelous light and be willing to love and be kind as you have asked us all to, Father. And Father, as we lay our heads down tonight, we ask you to watch over us and protect our families and our brothers and sisters tonight from the enemy that's out to destroy us. Father, we just thank you for all that you've given us in this day, the food that you've put on our tables, the water that we've been, we have to drink, the clothes that we put on our back. We thank you for all that you've given us, Lord. It's not that we deserve it, Lord. It's not that we earned it. It's because of your love you have for us. Thank you for our jobs and our families. All that you've given us is because of your love for us. Teach us to love each other as you have loved us, that we may be given as you have given us. Father, this we ask in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your grace and your mercy. We thank you, Lord, for your presence with us today. What a glorious day it has been. And thank you, Lord, for giving us traveling mercies as we travel to and from today. And tonight, Lord, we ask you to forgive us of our sins. Forgive us of our selfishness, our pride, our boasting, our backbiting, our lies and gossiping and idle spoken words, evil thoughts and actions that we do unto each other that we know is unpleasing in your sight. And again, Lord, we just always want to come, surrendering our hearts, our mind, our will to you, because we need to be cleansed every day. And our minds need to be renewed each and every day and renewing that right spirit within us. Again, Lord, we ask you to fill us with your Holy Spirit, giving us that love that we need, the love that covers a multitude of sin, and the love is fulfilling of your law. And, Lord, we just thank you for your grace and your mercy. Again, we want to continue to pray for those that have, that have asked for prayer. And we want to pray for that baby that was on Facebook that needed to be healed. And, and you know who it is, Lord. And we're bringing them up in prayer and ask your will to be done here on earth as it is in heaven. And, Lord, again, we 
I ask you to continue to use us as vessels that we may be witnesses for you. May we continue to show the world how much we love you and that we may continue to stand firmly fixed on your word and that we may be faithful in all that we do for you. Most importantly, may we be obedient unto your word. Again, Lord, we continue to pray for the marriages, for healing, for strength, for closeness. As family members, Lord, we continue to lift them up in prayer. We want to continue to pray for the grandkids and the children, Lord, that need to to bring those children to church, to find a church home. We continue to pray for our, our sons and daughters to get those kids in church. And we ask you will it be done in their lives here on earth as it is in heaven. And, Lord, we thank you for your word, which is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path each and every day. And we thank you for your love, your peace, your joy, your strength, and your protection, and the courage that you give to each and every one of us to do your will. We thank you for this program, Lord, that you give to us, that each and every time we hear, we can rejoice in you. We can praise your holy name and let the world know how much we love you. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. And may God bless you all and your family. Until tomorrow night, may he keep you and have a great night. And may the windows of heaven open and pour upon you a bundle of blessings. And have a good night. Thank you.